Okay, we are live. Wonderful. Hi. It's so great to see everyone. Welcome, I'm Chris Bergquist, the Merkin Curator of Education and Engagement at the Colby College Museum of Art. And I'd like to begin our time together by acknowledging that the museum is situated on the homeland of the Wabanaki people. And on behalf of the museum staff and our presenters tonight, I want to express our respect to the indigenous communities who have lived on these ancestral lands for almost 15,000 years and to future generations. And with this acknowledgement, recognize the legacies of settler colonialism and signal an ongoing commitment to building relationships with the Wabanaki. Thank you. Our program tonight, The Death of the Artist, is part of our Art and Series, programs that bring together visiting artists, scholars, museum staff, and community experts for conversations about exhibitions, collections, and projects at the Colby College Museum of Art and its Lunder Institute for American Art. This program is related to our newest <laughs> exhibition, Andrew Wyatt, Life and Death, Tanya Sheehan, the curator of that exhibition, and the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Art at Colby College will be facilitating the conversation. Just a few notes to enhance your experience. As questions come to you, you can submit them using the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. And if you need captioning, the closed caption button should also be at the bottom right of your screen. And so with that, I encourage you to just take a deep, relaxing breath and Take a moment to settle in as we turn things over to our facilitator, Penny Sheehan. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, let me just share my screen with everybody. And we'll get started. Can everybody see that? Look good, okay. Um, so as Chris mentioned, on June 2nd, the Colby College Museum of Art opened the exhibition, Andrew Wyeth, Life and Death, um, displaying publicly for the first time a group of drawings in which Wyeth envisioned his own funeral. Completed sometime in the early 1990s, the funeral group drawings represent the personal meditations of an artist preparing for death and synthesize a lifetime of Wyeth's reflections on what it means to mourn, to belong to a community, and to define one's legacy. The exhibition shows how the series also participates in conversations about mortality and self-portraiture that have been ongoing in American art since the 1960s. Artists' reflections on vulnerability, loss, and grief have become especially urgent in the context of the coronavirus pandemic and our national reckoning with racial inequality. I'm thrilled to be in conversation with the three living artists featured in Colby's exhibition. Dwayne Michaels is a conceptual photographer known for his experiments with multiple exposure, narrative sequence, and text. Janaina Chapa, is a transnational artist whose practice encompasses painting, drawing, sculpture, photography, video, and performance. Finally, Mario Moore is a painter, printmaker, and draftsman whose work focuses on black portraiture. All three artists have repeatedly used their own bodies in their art and reflected on death as a human experience. Tonight, we have invited Michaels, Chapa, and Moore to talk to us about the artworks they currently have on view at the Colby Museum, which you see in this slide, um, and to speak about how and why they have represented their own deaths or the possibility thereof. I'd like to begin by welcoming Dwayne Michaels. Welcome. <laughs> okay. I also give awe. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about humor, so you're already getting me to it. <laughs> okay, so let's start with this, this series that we've included in the exhibition. It's called The Man in the Room from 1975. Um, and because it's very difficult for people to digest this on screen, I will, I will give a little overview. Um, a first person narrative unfolds over the seven photographs in the series beginning with the narr narrator seeing a man whose funeral he had attended three days ago. 
By the end of the series, he realizes, and I'm quoting from your work, I was the one who was dead and the man in the room was alive. Um, and then the narrator further concludes, dying is nothing like what I had imagined it to be. So I'm wondering if you could start by telling us about how this series speaks to your interests in the 1960s and 70s in interrogating the boundaries between life and death. So what, what, were, you, what were you thinking through in this series and how might it relate to other things you were working on at the time? Well, I've always been very curious about the nature of death. We try to avoid death. We pretend it doesn't exist. I'm 90 now, so I'm looking down the barrel of death. Oh, I see you, I see you. And uh, it's all very peculiar. I mean, it's the most, it's the greatest singular, most important mystery that anybody could talk about. And uh, I've always been interested in the subject. Uh, my first book I did, Spirit Leaves the Body, Death Comes the Old Lady, and a Man Becomes a Star. And then the second book was, uh, I forgot what it was called. It's called The Journey of the Spirit After Death, based on Tibetan Book of the Dead. So it's the great, great subject. It's what else, what else it overlap? I mean, it, it makes every other subject uh, diminish in importance. It's the, the one subject that matters most of all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so your narrator says dying is nothing like what I had ma imagined it to be. Can I, can I ask what you imagined death to be when you made this work and how- Oh, well, I was, yeah, I was a right. kid, I was, I'm Go sorry. Ahead. No, I no. Was brought, but, oh, gotcha. I was <laughs> brought up Catholic. I believed every lie the Catholic Church ever mm. told. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in heaven, hell, blah, 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 blah. blah uh, uh, uh. But uh, so then what does happen? And uh, we have certain expectations. I know my mother probably thought she was going to go to hell. <laughs> uh, never mind. I won't even go there. But uh, so what, and if, your mind is everything, and would you put crap in your head? And if you, so he, the, the narrator had an idea that he would see angels and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And this is not what he expected, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I am also a fallen Catholic, so I, I can sympathize with this. Yeah. Um, how has your vision of death changed over recent years? As you say, you, you feel like you're moving closer to that thing. How is it changing? Oh, it's, uh, it's a constant curiosity. Mm. I always go back to it. And now, of course, I don't believe any of the, the myths that got us through life when you're a kid. Uh, now I think we go back into the soup. We are energy. We go back into the energy soup. I'm not sure. I don't want there to be reincarnation. Mm. I don't want to come back in 2070 when the planet's on fire and we're eating each other and not in a nice way wink wink right. nudge nudge but uh no i i have no idea what's going to happen but i'm very curious about it and i'm i'm actually excited to see what's going to happen don't yeah. ask me what we won't be able to ask you <laughs> well i could want to do. i could come back i could come you back could. And you could as so a matter of fact <laughs> I, I do have to tell you i saw my mother's ghost after she died and, and in the country, uh, we had a very old house, farmhouse, and I saw a ghost and these are facts. I'm not, mm. this is no be art bullshit or any of that. This is the fact, I did see two ghosts, you know, and I'm, I've been told I'm spooky myself, which is probably <laughs> true. <laughs> you would fit right in in Maine. We have, we have a lot of spooky houses here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the energy is still there. Everything is simultaneous. So this is this series, The Man in the Room, feels like a very serious series to me. But we're joking together now. And and the the end, the video that you made in 2019 yes, yes. also seems to combine um, the very serious with the comical. Um, can you tell us a little, little bit about this video for viewers who haven't seen it? Yeah, well, my I had a great friend, Fred. And we were together for 57 years. And the last seven years of his life, he had Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And we, after he died, uh, this was, he died in 2017, this was 2019. So this was my saluting his passing, but also mm -hmm. my idea of what happens when you die at that point. And uh, I think it's 
funny and strange is what it should be. And uh, it's yeah. full of surprises. You should, one should never be predictable. And once you become predictable, you stop being creative. And this is just another version of death. I, I think it's terrific. <laughs> it is terrific. We were so thrilled to be able to include it in the show yeah. um, where it's just playing on a loop all day. It's, it's about eight minutes, I believe. Um, and so you're, you're here in a, was this set in a Pittsburgh cafe or was meant to be a Pittsburgh cafe? No, it's a cafe, but not Pittsburgh. I happen, I'm from Pittsburgh, so I'm always promoting Pittsburgh. And it's, no, it's, it's, it was shot in a basement here in my house in New York. Okay. Okay. And um, so you're at this fictional cafe and you're yes. meeting the figure of death who then I'm, has a, well, I, I don't know who he is. I'm sitting at a table mm -hmm. and the guy wants to share my table and I'm, I, I'm polite, but I'm a little annoyed. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we involve in a conversation and then I'll leave this ending up to, you know, it's a surprise. Yeah, definitely. And he knew Fred, the man that you meet. Oh, no, no. He never knew Fred. No. That's the model. <laughs> Doing the character. Oh, the, the character. character. The character. Yes. yes. I want if I tell you what happened, then I'll give it away. So I won't tell you. Yeah. So you all have to watch the video. And I will, while we're continuing continuing to chat tonight, I'll put the uh the link to the video so you can see it if um you're unable to make it to the show. Um so what role would you say humor plays in your meditations on death? Uh you've heard of Gerald Murphy. I think he said the great revenge was on death uh, presumably was living well and i think the great revenge on death and life is having a sense of humor mm. you know it's you you can't you know you, you have to have a sense of humor otherwise you know your life is just too tragic to be uh anyway it's yeah. just very tragic and humor is the our great gay but well so he's murphy said uh having uh you know a sense of humor was in my sense, it, 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 I believe in having a sense of humor is a great revenge on death. Mm. And that's it. If you can yeah. gig, uh, giggling is a great, it makes you feel good too. Right. It's all absurd. It's totally, everything absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Boo. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I'm going to turn over, um, turn things over now to Janaina. Um, and we'll get your work up on the screen. So this is an installation view, not at Colby, but when your um, series 100 Little Deaths was shown in France in 2002. Um, so your series 100 Little Deaths, which began in 1996 and ended in 2002. Um, in that series, you, you pose as a fresh corpse in places around the world that you've lived or visited. Um, and we have two works on view from that series at Colby, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, can you can talk to us a little bit about how you staged each photograph? Like, how do you actually make these? Who takes the pictures? How does that work? I mean, I think it, it, it kind of changed during the mm -hmm. process because it was a couple of years. In 96, I moved to New York. And when I moved here, I was working on a series of performances throughout the city, basically kind of to arrive and to understand my place and who I was in that context. And I think at the time I was looking at a lot of works by artists like Ipasiana, the performance art mainly. And I was very mm -hmm. interested in how to position the body and how to insert myself in society, how to perceive myself in a different culture, in a different country. You know, coming from uh, Germany and Brazil, I grew up in both places, my father being German, my mother being Brazilian, which is quite different. And so I was always like told that I did not belong to the place I was growing up or I didn't look like the place I was growing up, but either it would be in Germany or in Brazil. So there was a bit of a placelessness that I felt. And when I arrived in New York, I was doing those performances and it would include, in a way, picturing myself going to all these different places, being all these different characters in a way, mm -hmm. but also just trying to insert myself. And I think it's always kind of, for me, interesting now when I look back, because it was basically six years where I was traveling a lot between countries and kind of revisiting places or just like living the place I was in and it was always like a short time you know in that mm -hmm. time throughout that time I was 
couple of months here and then I would move on. And it was a kind of a search of where to belong and how to belong as a, as a woman, as a Brazilian, mm. as a German. It was, it had all these questions, but it had also a lot of humor because I didn't want to stage, it wasn't like an accident or a dramatic death. It was my, more kind of a passive sort of mm. lying down, embracing the floor in a way. And I called it, that's why also the title 100 Little Deaths, because mm -hmm. it also has a connotation to the French, Le Petit Mort. Le Petit Mort is an orgasm. So it's a, it's a piece of something that happens that, that you live in that place. You know, it could be a love story. It could be a, just a traveling story. It could be a story, you know, like all, I collected basically all the stories and I was not trying to conquer the space, you know, like I was looking at, you know, when you see photographs of um, colonial photographs, when men came and conquered, they're always standing there very strongly and having this whole attitude. And my attitude was basically the opposite. I wasn't trying to conquer the space. I was trying to basically infiltrate myself, belong and kind of be accepted and embrace it. So there was a passiveness and a reflection also about my role in that place and how much I could want from that place. Or mm. I didn't want to impose myself to that place, but I wanted to, in a way, also be gentle about it and, and show my fragility. And I think that yeah. it's kind of a play with that. and. The photography really changed throughout the years because when I started those performances, it was really just me with a camera and I had nine seconds to die, basically. So I would like put the camera somewhere, run and kind of, you know, be on the floor. Sometimes I have a cigarette on my hand still because I forgot to like, take it away. But it was kind of a very intimate performance also. It was really like being in the garden of a, of a boyfriend that I was living with at the time or visiting a place that I lived in Salvador when I was living in Brazil and revisiting it and remembering things. But I, it was, the camera was always somewhere. That's why like it's very low on the floor, especially in these two photographs. You see that the point of view, you know, the camera was like just on a, on a little bench somewhere close mm -hmm. to me. And then at, as, as I continued throughout the process, I, I understood that <clears throat> one time I was in a, in a restaurant in Spain and the restaurant was already closed and I sneaked in and I kind of did one of those photos. And then I did a couple because I had the feeling it wasn't digital, it was negative. So I couldn't see the image. It's not like now with the iPhoto that selfies became like everybody's a professional selfie maker. I wasn't. So the, with the negative camera, you place it and you play a little bit with the chances that your head might be chopped off, the foot might be chopped off, so you do a couple. And then at the day, the, the cleaning lady came out from behind and said, well, do you need a hand? You look like you're struggling. I can just take your picture. And I was like, yeah, of course you can. And I placed the camera in her hand and she took the pictures. And then it opened up for me a whole new you know, space of like how to understand the performance and how to invite people in that were around. And, and then I would have their point of view. So continuing, mm. you know, then you can see some of the photographs are taken then from more far away because it mm -hmm. was already someone that I met on mm -hmm. the way that I invited to kind of take the photograph and they would take a couple of photographs. And I had a different kind of reflection on editing the photographs because it was their point of view. And then I would go back to do them on my own. So for me, it was an, a very interesting exercise, mm. you know, and I did come to an end at some point. And I always thought maybe one day I will continue when the time is ripe for it, you know, because I think performance art has a lot to do with your own history and with the reflection on the space you are on the you know on on how you can function in 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 that place in all kinds of ways and obviously the reflection on death for me you know what it wasn't really the, the the physical death it was kind of like the 
giving yourself over to some an, a, unexpected place or a place that you didn't know. And I, for me, moving from countries, you know, to different country, different cultures, I felt like I needed to give myself in and to be kind of fearless about what to expect you know, and, and have that kind of attitude towards yeah. things. I mean, fearless, but as you said before, also fragile and vulnerable in those spaces. And that sort of um, sometimes incongruous combination of the two uh, is something. Yeah, I always speaking. felt, I always felt that the strength of, especially women in throughout history yeah. was to, 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 to be, as courageous as they understood how to show fragility. You know, yeah. I think that that's a strength that accompanied women and made them very strong because they were able to mm -hmm. show and not to try to pretend that they are something that they're not, but actually to show, I mean, they were expected to be fragile. That's another story, yes. but, uh, but they also knew how to show the fragility without fear, without trying mm. to hide it. And for me, it was very important to show that, you know, not, not to pretend that I'm arriving, mm. conquering the space, you know, right. standing up position, you know, telling people I'm here. I wanted to tell people I'm there in a very humble way because right. showing myself first, you know, from the most fragile position mm -hmm. in a way possible not even revealing my identity I would right. always lie face down because it wasn't about my face it was mm -hmm. about you know my the perception of the whole and how I was trying to be perceived by different societies and different you know um, cultural backgrounds Along those lines, when I see the photos in your series, um, they evoke for me the physical violence and death that women have experienced when, say, traveling alone, um, even in the most picturesque of landscapes, and many of your landscapes are quite picturesque. Um, do you see your work as making a political statement regarding violence against women? I mean, I like to see work, I mean, I like to be very honest and very direct with the work. And I think that I like the idea of putting something out there that can be interpreted. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not trying to preach a specific point of view. I am trying just to be very open and honest and show something. And whatever I will, you know, get out of the viewer in terms of the sentiment that the person is going to have looking at the picture, there is a piece of reality there. Yeah. Obviously, when you look at a picture like that and it makes you think of that, it's because it is there somewhere, you know, it is inside of us, it is inside of each viewer. And I think that that's, for me, was very important. That's why I think that also the pictures as a whole, you know, they, they, they are very different from each other. You know, they do, they're more intimate, some of them, some of them have humor, they're kind of silly almost, because I like to embrace all those different situations because that's what makes us be what we are, you know, and uh, I'm not trying to push it to one place or the other, but I always am very fascinated to hear the feedback, mm -hmm. you know, on those, because I do think that they trigger the personal experience, you know, it's like a travel book and we all traveled by ourselves at some point yeah. with our own person and we experience different things in different cultures and in different places. And I think that's, that for me was very um, fascinating because I wanted to understand why in this country I was perceived this way, why in that one and you know, all these different contexts. Like, so with my family, my mom, my sisters, my dad, like, we, like they all looked different. They came from different places and we were all trying to adapt somewhere. And then we all had strange stories of adaptations in different places that were not necessarily nice and some were nice and it was surprising. So I think I was trying to, in a way, touch on all those subjects without being so much on your face, but trying mm -hmm. to be, you know, something that it can make you smile, but it will make you think, and then it can make you smile again. So I like to be in that place. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Um, I want to welcome Mario Moore um, to the conversation. Um, 
the silver point drawing uh, titled Fall that we included in the Colby Museum exhibition is a self-portrait uh, that belongs to a series you created in 2017-18 titled Recovery. Um, and I'm showing everybody an installation shot um, of when, when Recovery was on view in Detroit, I believe. Um, so can you share with us what inspired that series and which subjects you chose to include in it? Yeah, so the the series kind of uh, grew out of um, really facing death, like in a, in a literal way. Um, so I had I had to have I had a tumor and I had to have brain surgery, and um, leading up to that moment, uh, for me it was kind of thinking about the potential of not being here anymore, right after that, <laughs> and also at the same time the potential of not being able to make art. <laughs> like, cause that's all I want to do, right? I would just want to make art. Um, and I think the past works that I created that focused on death um, in any kind of way were more out of a, a fear uh, because in, in that instance, though the older works before the recovery period were something that I couldn't control meaning how my body was perceived in the United States, right? When it comes to police officers and that kind of notion, it was, it was based on a concept of fear that my life might be abruptly ended. Um, and this body of work was more about the idea of accepting the fact that I might not be here after this moment. Mm -hmm. um, but after I did have the brain surgery, and I was able to recover, I started to think about moments of rest and relaxation um, for black men uh, mm -hmm. in the United States and kind of chronicled my own like physical recovery and mental recovery after that brain surgery. Yeah, I mean, you, you just mentioned the concept of black rest, um, which is central to your work. So how do you define that concept? Well, honestly, I had no idea how to define it. <laughs> <laughs> Because it was it was something that I I, I didn't do. It was elusive, uh, right? It's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I think also the, the thing is we live, uh, you know, in America, right? In a, a kind of consumption economy, right? A consumerism and capitalism. Um, your value is equated to what you make and mm -hmm. what you produce, right? It's equated to doing something every day, right? That has some kind of benefit. Right, that can make money, um, some kind of exchange. Um, so, you know, especially for you know people in my family and people I grew up with, um, that's what you had to do because you had a lot of little, you had a little of that economic value, right? So the idea of rest and relaxation wasn't even on the quota. It wasn't on the mind to be like, oh, I'm going to go take a vacation or I'm going to take a break or you know that kind of thing. No, you had to be able to, to, to make a check and, and you know, pay for bills, send your kids to school, whatever the case was. So what kind of led me to that notion and, and trying to think about it was that I was unable to make art for, for a couple of weeks because my body would, would not physically let me do what I wanted my body to do. And in that time, um, that time period, I started to think historically about the idea of resting for black men. Specifically, mm -hmm. I start to think about my dad. Um, he's a blue collar uh, kind of guy, um, always had a job, um, especially, you know, in Detroit, the, the kind of, you know, kind of blue collar sensibilities that are here. Um, and, and for him, the idea of a vac vacation is, that's crazy. What? What you going to take a break for? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, like, so, you know, that sensibility and thinking yeah. Um, forced me to kind of take a moment and a breather and then start to think about these historical figures who actually had to take a break, even mm -hmm. though um, how America sees them as far as Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, James Baldwin, we see them at the podium, boisterous, screaming, yelling, always vocal, but they took vacations. They had <laughs> moments of rest with their family. You know, uh, there's a really great image of James Baldwin um, kind of lounging on his porch, you know? So I started to think about those moments and, and figuring out, well, how can I kind of channel that in this work? Um, and also start to think about this idea of embracing uh, the rest that I, I need to have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thinking about 
all of that in relation to fall, um, there's a really fine line, especially in works like this one, which is self-portrait, where you use your own body, where there's a, a fine line between this concept of black rest and an image of black death. Mm. Um, so can you, can you talk to us a little bit about that, um, maybe through this image? Yeah, I, you know, for one thing, I think over and over again, um, historically, America has a desire to see Black death, right? Mm -hmm. There's, um, you know, a history with those images and the repetitiveness of it. And even in the contemporary art world, right? It's a, it's a kind of thing that continually happens. So in thinking about this moment for myself and embracing something like that, but also this idea of rest, I had to figure out how to balance the, the traumatization of, of me as a black man, right? And my body, but also the acceptance of this moment for myself. And what does that mean? And then coming to a place where it's really about peace, mm -hmm. right? Because there's the, the one thing that happens with the silver point drawings, and I had no idea what silver point was for the longest. <laughs> you know, I would go to museums and see Da Vinci and Michelangelo and say silver point on the wall. And I'd be like, that looks so amazing, but I have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. um, but the value of finding this medium and using it, which was really incredible for me because it creates a very soft value, right? So everything is very slow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can only get so dark, right? So the, the image is a really, really light image. Um, and I think that's really important for works dealing with these kind of issues, you know? Um, so there was a, there was an embrace into it, but also a moment where I didn't want to have any kind of action happening. I didn't want to, you know, see like a brutalization of a body. I didn't want to see anything like that, but, I, but I want it to be almost like a reflection, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was standing in front of this work at the Colby Museum with a group of our docents and there was a hot debate about what exactly they were seeing um, and whose perspective it was from. Um, so everyone seemed to agree that the viewer was kind of standing in the Converse sneakers, looking down upon you. But whether you were lying on a table as if, as you're lying on the table in the image of the brain's, brain surgery about to happen or underway, um, or whether you were on the ground, like on a sidewalk, um, there was a lot of debate about that. And I think it changes things in terms of that, you know, where you place that distance. Um, you're not going to give us the answer, I'm assuming, but no, any, I'm any thoughts on that debate? Any thoughts on the debate? Yeah, um, I would say I, I love that. I yeah, love yeah. that, uh, you know, and that's, I think that's the value in art, right? Mm. It, for me, a work is not finished unless people see it. Right. Because they're, they're bringing something to the work that whether you, you know, you put everything into it, right? And then the audience, the viewer comes and adds another part or they see something um, that you might not see. Um, I will say for this piece, uh, I'm not going to say whether it's on a table or on the ground, right? No. Whoever looks Don't at tell it. us, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but for, for me, um, it was a notion of, uh, of me standing over myself. Mm. but also giving the opportunity for other people to kind of coming into that space, right? Um, and I, I love that. I love that. That's wonderful. It reminds me of a photograph that Dwayne Michaels um, made of uh, self-portrait as if I were dead. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we, we had wanted to include that in the show for obvious reasons, but we're unable to. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really wonderful thinking of that as a re reflection on yourself. Yeah, it's, um, you know, yeah, I just want to say one thing, like, because uh, that's in the catalog, and I uh, and I yeah. saw that uh, image that that Duane um, created, and yeah. it's the composition is so similar to the painting that I made, and mm. I had no idea about this this image, and I just think it's like so incredible to think about yeah. the kind of uh, nuances of artists and also the 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 similarities that can happen over time um, yeah. about these kind of uh, uh, notions. Well, this is a perfect segue to inviting you all to ask questions to one another about your work. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and we can all see each other. 
a little bit better. Um, so we've been talking about how you've all used your own bodies to meditate on the boundaries between life and death. Um, do you have reflections on what you've seen each other doing, resonate, things that resonate? Uh, Mario, you just mentioned something really in relation to Dwayne's work. Yeah, I'm, I'm, for, for me, the question I have for, for you, Dwayne, is, is how did you come to, to that work that you created of you standing over your, your own body? Um, I know how I, I got there, you know, a couple of years ago, but I'm curious uh, to figure out, you know, how you approach that. Well, that's a very old picture. I, I did that. Oh my God. I, <laughs> and what are you, 12 or 13? <laughs> you know, pretty I, much, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> but I thought it was so many decades and it was done in the, must have been done in the 60s. Yep. 1860. So a long time ago. I don't know, it's just, a, I have a C. Dick, C. Spot, C. Jane brain. And um, was there a date there? No. 68, anyway, I believe it's 68. Yeah, yeah. and um, the worst part of doing that, you see that thing on the wall above my head? Mm -hmm. uh, I, did, I did that by myself. And I, I knew that if I was under that stripe, I wouldn't crop my head off. So I had no idea that was simply, then I forgot to take it down once I set it up. No, but just, it was just a very simple, I have a C. Dixie Jane brain, as I said, and, you know, so it's simply, you know, what would I look like when I was dead? And uh, I thought it was funny. I mean, funny and serious and hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. I, I literally, you know, uh, it's, it's just like that. If I think of like somebody going to heaven, I'll make them go to heaven, literally, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, or hell. Or whatever. Yeah. I have a C. Dick, C. Jane Brain. I don't see Dick as much as I used to, but that was a long time ago. Blum, ba -dum, blum. <laughs> uh, there you go. Now we got to laugh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then what happened? Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I think it's interesting since we're all dealing with that subject, you know, I always experience this kind of performance. I think if it, you perform it, if you draw it, the imagery, you know, like how to see yourself in that sort of very alone space. I mean, I think for me, the, the nicest part in that performance was in a way the, 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 lo the, the loneliness that I had, which was a nice one, it wasn't a negative one, but it was a space of reflection of, of rehearsing something of a complete loneliness, you know, and, and how, and I actually every day looked for that space because once I had a camera in my hand and once I was lying face down, you know, I was in that space that was so private mm -hmm. and so mine. And I, I feel like when I see both of you guys work, you know, I see that space, you know, that kind of space where, it can be humorous or it can be super sad, but it's very alone. It's a very, it's a construct that puts you in a space, that, but that is also comforting. And I was just curious if, if, it, if it is like that for you, you know? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> I'm practicing. And oh, <laughs> oh. uh, 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 the, the human condition is to be alone. Our essence is to be alone. No matter how close you are to somebody, we are alone. We were born alone and we will die alone. So that's why love is so important because for the moments you love somebody, you're not alone to the degree that you're involved with the person. But we have to stop looking at the facts. I, I'm not interested in what it looks like to die. What I wanna know is what does it feel like? Literally, what happens when you're dead? Try to. I try to do that without even showing a body because you can't, I mean, abandon the body, all ye who enter here. No, you got, you have to see it as energy. It is pure energy divesting itself and taking on a new form. And so I try to avoid showing bodies, although it's impossible, but it's just energy. That's all you can say about it. Mm -hmm. I think the, the other thing too is like to think about the, the moment that you're actually because you you know you you kind of both mentioned this where especially you're in this personal space and you're creating this safe space for yourself to do this thing um, and 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 then you have to run over right put the timer on you know you mentioned this earlier and it's like 
like for me, like for, for, you know, a couple of those images, it's like, all right, set the timer on. Okay, run over. Now look really comfortable and now cover yourself. You know, it's this, it's this whole act and mm -hmm. it's kind of comical, you know, mm -hmm. and then you want the image, right, to kind of portray a, a certain kind of, um, uh, uh, whether it's melancholy, seriousness or, or whatever, but together in this very kind of funny moment that you're having with yourself. And there's also a level of level of comfort there. And I think that space is interesting, um, you know, because you have to be, I think you have to be alone for it. But it's also interesting when you do bring something like that into a public space, like performance wise, like if you do something like that for other people to see, that's also, I mean, that's even more vulnerable, right? Because you're bringing this very personal, vulnerable space into the public eye to kind of witness the magic as it's happening, you know? Um, so yeah, when you said that, the setting the timer and then running over, like, uh, it, like that's exactly what I was, I was thinking about myself doing that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just think it's fascinating because basically we're so used to be expected to perform in certain ways, like to look good, to be mm -hmm. assertive, to walk into a space in a party and be, you know, the center of attention, like that's the expectation that we grew up, like that's how you have to act and that's how the, the energy you have to pass on. And then when you perform something like that, that you're like lying down, face down, performing something where you're everything opposite of, of what is expected from you, you know, like I think that that's, I figured out that it was a very comforting space for me just to understand that I didn't have all these expectations around me for that moment, that I actually created that space myself and I'm, I was allowing myself to be viewed in a complete different way. You know, that where people were like, oh, like what is wrong with her? Like, is she sick? You know, is she fainted? Is she, did she collapse? And all this, all of a sudden, I was completely out of a space of expectation. And mm. for me, that's where performance became so vital in my like daily routine that I could allow myself to be out. And I could allow myself to, you know, be viewed in a way that it wasn't expected at all. And it was, you know, against the expectations of what, you know, my whole, like the anxiety would build up for that, especially sometimes like being in a different country in a different culture where you mm -hmm. start wondering. And I think that it's quite a relief when you kind of allow yourself to, you know, that space. So I'm gonna take that as a segue to my final question before we turn things over to the audience. Um, so at the Colby Museum in this exhibition, we're also challenging expectations by putting your work not only in conversation with one another, but in conversation with Andrew Wyeth. Um, so I'm wondering what you all think about that. Um, is this the first time you've imagined your work in conversation with his? Um, is it a, a, you know something that is, was a surprising choice for you? And, and what do you think about that? Me first, me first. Okay. Um, so I have always loved Andrew Wyatt. His, I like theater. Life is theater. This is a theater. This is a traveling show we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I view my photographs as theater. I've, every single thing is a theatrical moment. We're all, and who strut and fret our moment upon the stage, unquote. And in his work, uh, Christina's World, you know, that's such an emotional picture. And uh, to squeeze emotion out of facts, uh, mm -hmm. you would have to bring a certain amount too, but he did it constantly, always. And uh, talk of, of painters and being hip and cool and all that nonsense, uh, if, you, if there's no passion, if there's no pain, mm -hmm. if there's no emotion, then it's just an observation. And observation is not the thing itself. Right. Yeah, I think for me, I've always looked at his work and, and just found his work, one, powerful, but also intense. And, and, and in a way, like an example is he'll, um, he'll paint a window and light coming through a window and it'll just be that. There's no figure in it. 
but the power in that creates a narrative in itself. And the other thing about um, uh, Andrew Wyatt's work is like he'll paint boots or grass and, and that's it. And it'll be so much information mm. within the, the kind of feeling of the image that it kind of creates its own kind of persona, right? It's, it's not just now it's a still life. No, this is like, it's almost like every, every image turns into an individual, mm-hmm. right? Like every painting turns into an individual. Um, so, so that for me has always kind of like carried his, his, uh, his work um, into something like where you're trying to like, I want to get there, you know, it's like the power of, of, of doing that. And another thing about his work is that his work is very slow. Yeah. Meaning you go and stand in front of a painting that is boots and grass and you will stand in front of that painting for a long time. Like there's nothing going on in it. But for some reason, the way that it's put together, like mm-hmm. holds on to you. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that has always fascinated me. And drawing, of course, is central to his work in the way it is mm-hmm. in yours as well. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that that was like the, the, the poetic approach of also like doing those, those funeral drawings. Yeah. I mean, to try to portrait people that were feeling that pain in that moment and with a couple of lines I mean the way he was like master and like just being able to express that solitude and that pain of the the. so I think it's a it's an amazing for me it was a surprise in a way in a Mm. obviously um I'm not American so like he's an American painter and it was like not that I grew up knowing so much about his work Mm -hmm. and so for me it was a very pleasant obviously surprise because it's like a a a painter that I admire a lot and I think that the subject matter obviously you know just the the solitude that is in all the paintings you know that what Mario was describing you know even if it's just the grass even if it's just a shadow of window and and to be able to talk about that space you know, where people find themselves, you know, in, in dealing with loss. I mean, to talk yeah. about loss in general, I think is a very delicate, very courageous um, subject matter, obviously, to, to, to tackle in. And the geographical location in which he chose to do that work, I think, is just as meaningful as it was for you in your series, Janine. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So he chose Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, which was the place of his birth. And it was also, you know, specifically Kerner's Hill, which is a place from which you can see the location where his father um, died in an automobile accident. So yeah, no, and I think that, yeah, the way that he embraces landscape and landscape Mm -hmm. becomes part of the, that life that he's describing and that loss and that history, because obviously, you know, that's, where you come from and where you think you're going to go to, like what's the cycle of life. So the the way that landscape is portrayed in his painting is pretty, um, yeah, fascinating, like how he tackled to to be in that space, you know? Yeah. Um, Um, Wonderful. So I, I want to turn things over to the audience. We have about 10 minutes with them. Um, we do have a question from for um, Janaina, um, where we have someone wondering if you can cite any artistic influences that inspire your photographic practice. Um, for them, the 100 Little Death series reminded them of photographs by uh, Cindy Sherman and Ana Mendieta. Um, well, I obviously pictures? looked at both yeah, works a lot growing up. Ana Mendieta especially, I have to say, she was a like, um, you know, someone that was dealing with performance, but she also had the humor in her performances, you know, the portraits that she made with the glass where she would like smash her face against the glass. Like there was like this physical approach um, of her body and the earth creating the silhouette, drawing that silhouette in places, carving it out in a way, also creating a space for her body to fit in the landscape. So obviously those were works that I was looking at. Cindy Sherman as well, because it was about the self 
you know, portraiture in the landscape, in a cityscape, or dressed up in different um, professions, sometimes or in different personas or spaces or places in society. So obviously, I looked at a lot of performance, uh, Maya Darren as well, or Bastian Ada was one of my favorite artists. And, you know, the, um, the last, the search of the miraculous, the last performance he did where he actually lost his life and it wasn't, he, I, do, I do not believe that he was wanting for that to happen. It was, I think it was a tragic yeah. accident, I believe. I mean, there's like different opinions about it, but but the performance itself to like put yourself out there with that kind of courage, you know, looking for the miraculous, going into a little boat, departing into the ocean by yourself in a tiny little sailboat. I mean, for me, that's the ultimate performance that an artist ever did. So I have a comment um, from an audience member um, that gets us back to the subject of humor. Um, so I'll read, I'll just share this with everyone. So it says humor enables us to explore difficult or painful feelings collectively. And at least in American culture, dissection, um, discussions, <laughs> dissections, discussions <laughs> about death are so <laughs> taboo. It's wonderful to see these artists works and have the opportunity to go there through humor, um, curiosity and new perspectives. Um, wasn't there a time in our history when the dead were photographed in their coffins as a keepsake for the surviving family? I wonder when that switch went off and we moved from the notion of capturing the reality of death, um, uh, normal death that is, as opposed to graphic deaths such as murders or accidents, to denying that it's an es essential part of human life. Um, would any of you like to speak to that? So this idea of seeing death as taboo in American culture, um, and how that's a real change from the past. Yeah, I think uh, what kind of quantified the change in that was war, um, mm -hmm. you know, particularly the Civil War. Some of the first photographs, a lot of tin types um, were created from the kind of brutality of Civil War. And um, nationally, that became a kind of really traumatic experience. So from that moment, death was seen as something not as peaceful, but as terror and tragic. Uh, and then you have other notions of that happening again, in World War I and then World War II. So that that changed, because I know what they're talking about, uh, these moments where you, you have people, you also had you also have photographs of family members sitting next to dead family members in other images. But I think war changed the the trauma of of that, the representation of that. It also depends on the social identity of the subject, whether it's taboo oh, yeah. to see or not. Um, you mentioned before, Mario, this sort of proliferation of images of um, dead black men uh, and women in the in the media, and for some reason, that's okay. Um, that continues to be okay. It's consumed um, ravenously, mm -hmm. um, but yet, you know, perhaps we're talking about a taboo on white death. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that is that is very, very specific. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, it's it's, you know, that I think that's, that's different, right? Because you have the, the Emmett Till moment, yeah. right? Where, where Emmett Till's mother is, is portraying her dead son, um, and giving the permission for that photograph to be right. distributed. Um, so you know, that that becomes an, another notion, and, it, and it's, you know, shared broadly, but it's also to kind of bring attention to uh, a really problematic and uh, extreme example of, of how America views, uh, you know, a group of people. Um, so, you know, and then, and then what happens is, it's like the over consumption of that, because it happens over and over again, and it, be, it becomes less impactful. And then, it, and then it just becomes painful, you know, continuously. Yeah, so that's a different um, perspective here. Yeah. Dwayne, Janina, did you want to add anything to that question? Well, I'll be there soon. I can come, <laughs> if you want, I can come back and pound on your, I'll come back at night. If you hear- No, <laughs> not at nine. If you hear farting sounds and nobody's there, that will be me. So, <laughs> woo, woo. 
Ooh, how's that? <laughs> oh, it's not so bad over here. Come on over, try it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think that especially also social media. I I think that the image itself and like it's been distorted and 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 exploited in a way that I think that the you know the the more the more drama and the more violence is in the picture. You know, like. And people devour that kind of images without much mm -hmm. sentiment and yeah, because it's expected to be that violent, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. like you, you want to see like, oh yeah, there's a lot of violence going on like in the Amazon right now or in America, the shootings right now. And then this whole like imagery just pop and it's pretty crazy because people are getting so used to that level of violence. And then we get violence all the time. We're getting it all the time. And mm -hmm. the kids are growing up with look, like looking at that kind of violence and seeing also how many likes that kind of imagery would bring and how many, how much attention they get with that kind of violence and which is scary, you know, like I think, yes. What's wrong, what's wrong with violence? People should play violence all the time. I have a sister, I had a cousin who played a violin and she wasn't violin at all, but she would play <laughs> violin songs like this, you know, but she, she was very, thank you, Gilda Radner. That's one of the funniest things is you will diffuse it. Violence right. on television, should we have it? Yes, it's yes. in the symphony. I agree, I agree 100%. <laughs> Well, we have one more comment from the audience that I think Dwayne is going to jump on, but I, I could be wrong. Um, so this is in reference to Wyeth's artwork of his own representations of his own funeral. Um, do you all believe uh, that the funeral is a performance in, it, in itself um, after death with the open casket in some cultures? Um, what does this performance say about our most fragile state as humans? And what does it say about the human soul after death? No, it, it's totally a performance. Everything is a performance. Mm -hmm. You've got to see your, see your life as a performance, a drama. Mm -hmm. Some of it's farce and some of it isn't. And for a lot of people, the religious performance, the rites. When Fred died, we, he was uh, cremated and I'm going to be cremated and I am going to be I want my ashes thrown in Trump's eyes so he'll go blind <laughs> and fall down a flight of steps and break his nose. So uh, that's all a right. performance. It's all performance. <laughs> that's the best. I want to see that one. Yeah. Oh, I, would, I would pay to see that. I would so pay to see that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I think that is the best place to end <laughs> this wonderful conversation. I am so grateful to each of you um, for making us laugh and maybe cry a little. I don't know. We've did everything tonight. Um, thank you for, for being here. <laughs> All right, yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That was a really nice talk. I'm very grateful. Yeah. I want to um, remind everyone to visit the Colby Museum before October 16th to see the art discussed today on view in Andrew Wyeth Life and Death. Um, you can also read about it in the catalog accompanying the exhibition, which is available for purchase through the museum's website and on major online booksellers who will not be named. <laughs> <laughs> If I go to the Colby, yes, and I catch a cold, uh, will you pick up the price of my medication and my heart? <laughs> Let's discuss. <laughs> Let's discuss. Thank you. Everybody comes to Colby at their own risk, <laughs> <laughs> but it's beautiful in the summer in Maine, so you should be just fine. I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, it's thank you all. Have a thank wonderful you. night. Thank you. All bye. right. Bye. Bye. bye.